Dear colleagues, dear friends, as President of ESSERT, I welcome you to our third plenary lecture, which is held here at the Catholic University of Lyon, one of the most important private institutions of higher learning here in France, established in 1875. But the rector, Thierry Magnin, who is again with us, will say a little more about it later. Today it has five faculties of law, of theology, philosophy, sciences, literature, a number of vocational training schools, about, if I'm right, 10,000 students, 12,000 students are enrolled in the Catholic University. Let me take the opportunity to thank uh, Rector Thierry Magnier for having us here today in this interesting building. As you might have seen, it's a combination of an old building and a very new modern building. The old building was a prison uh, in the form of a panopticum. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, I think, invented that. And uh, some of you might know it from Michel Foucault of his Discipline and Punish. Discipline is something that is characteristic for the modern era. Here it is, one can say, encaged, encaved in a very modern open light glass building. I don't know what, if that has any meaning, but uh, <laughs> it, it's an interesting and nice building anyway. Our lecture here at the uh, Université Catholique is sponsored by one of our partners of this conference, the International Society for Science and Religion, and I welcome the uh, chairman of the executive committee, Fraser Watts, who is with us at this conference, and I will later welcome the president of ISSR, who is on his way uh, to our uh, meeting, uh, Michael Rice, and he will say later a few words to ISSR, who which is sponsoring uh, this lecture. Today's lecture will be given by Professor Philip Clayton, who barely needs an introduction to anybody who is engaged with science and theology, and who is also well known here at Lyon University, where he lectured on different occasions. Dear Phil, we are very happy to have you here with us today, and it's a privilege that you are here at our ESSAT conferences. Philip Clayton is Ingraham Professor at Claremont School of Theology and an affiliated faculty member at Claremont Graduate University with previous faculty positions at Williams College, the California State University. He received a joint doctorate in philosophy and religious studies from Yale University and is the author or editor of some 24 books, hundreds of articles, and I will spare you the list of it. He had professorships, fellowships at the University of Munich. He's excellent in German, by the way. Uh, so if you hear us talk in German, don't be uh, astonished, because he spent some time in Munich with Wolfgang Pannenberg, the University of Cambridge and Harvard uh, University. Uh, most of you will know where he works on the intersection of science, philosophy, and theology, and has uh, especially focused on emergent dynamics in biology and uh, in the theory of consciousness. I will not say much more about his work because we are more eager to listen to what he wants to say today. And he will speak about the open-ended universe, immanence and transcendence in science and religion. Phil, the floor is yours. Thanks very much and welcome to all of you. I am grateful as the other speakers have been for the organizers, but mostly I'm excited to speak to ESAT, um, which the first time I did so was 1994. So it's a long, and I met Jean at that meeting. Uh, you are brilliant and you share the same interests that I do. So you will be my most critical audience. Perhaps my respondent will be the most critical. Um, and I want to please all of you, so I've included some science and some philosophy, but I've removed some of the theology because Chris did such a good job yesterday. So I'll let him carry that. Our conversations have been focusing on issues of imminence and transcendence. 
on the study of nature and the ways that nature may point beyond itself. The ESOT organizers have linked this question to the scientific commitment to methodological naturalism. They write, because any scientific object of investigation must be identified by reference to natural entities, and any scientific explanation can only refer to natural causes. As they note, this is bad news for causal claims about God, angels, and souls. So, what then about the hypothesis that God exists? Imagine we say only that God is a being that is not less than personal, that preceded the universe, and that will survive its final heat death. This means a being who could exist before and without the Big Bang, which means a being that is not wholly dependent on natural laws. I take it that such a being, if it exists, would be the paradigm case of transcendence, no? You lot, by contrast, dear ESAT members, appear to lack all of these properties. I'm very sorry. Um, this means that you are the quintessential example of imminent entities. If you're transcendent, please raise your hand. In short, even if we work only with the most minimal description of God and remain agnostic about all the other divine attributes that theists have affirmed, we are already confronted with the paradox of the imminent and transcendent. So this is why I have thought of nature and beyond with a question mark. It's not established that there is a beyond, or as the German names it, ein Jenseits, something on the other side. But if there is, what would have to be the case for it to be knowable by humans in any sense? Now, we can imagine what would produce the strongest knowledge of God. Perhaps we possess a direct awareness of divine presence. Perhaps there's a clear and unmediated voice that you can hear inside your head that correctly predicts the future and guides you in the best thing to be done. Perhaps there's a scripture that provides infallible knowledge of God's eternal nature. But what about those of us who don't have these things? Well, let's think about signals of transcendence. What is the least that humanity might know about God, a transcendent being? Or, more precisely, what do we affirm beyond what science can offer when we speak of a transcendent being or dimension? What kind of knowledge claims are we making? And if this knowledge is possible, how would it be related to the methods and results of the particular sciences? So think with me about this. Clearly, if there exists a beyond, then the universe must be open to it, if we're to know it. The transcendent must allow for a way of speaking about the universe, and it should add something to other forms of thought. For many of us, talk of transcendence must be compatible with science. If you don't believe that, maybe you're in the wrong room. That is, it must be consistent with the possibility of doing science. But must it be detectable by science? Provable by scientific results in the way that natural theology has claimed. This is a huge issue, and many of you are world experts on this question. Let's specify the question more carefully. Does the scientific picture of the natural world give signs of the existence of a transcendent dimension? And if so, what kind of knowledge claims are being made? Are they only visible to people who are already people of faith so that they serve as a sort of subjective confirmation of their faith? in the sense of fides quaerens intellectum? 
Or do these signals require some sort of divinely inspired inner intuition to be efficacious? Or are they perhaps valid arguments, even though many may resist them, perhaps because of their sin? Alvin Plantinga. Or should the signals of transcendence persuade every unbeliever who considers them, even, say, Richard Dawkins? Let's find out. E Dear Richard, <laughs> emergent complexity. I invited him, but he wasn't free. Um, but interested, he wanted to come to Lyon, the Catholic University. Uh, an open-ended universe is one in which new systems evolve and new phenomena emerge. The sciences show us not only that emergence pervades the universe, they tell us much about how it works, and in particular about the exponential growth in complexity once brains evolve to the complexity of human brains. Even apart from the theological questions, Chris, it is fascinating to study the scientific questions. What kind of phenomena emerge? How are they related? And why do they occur in this order? Now, what does it mean for a system to be emergent? If an organism, system, or structure at a particular level or stage of evolution is emergent, it is not fully explainable in terms of the phenomena and laws at a lower level of complexity or at an earlier stage of evolution. I want to emphasize, to discover unexpected emergence in this sense is not a failure of science, is not a failure of science. Of course, it may well be seen as a failure from the standpoint of one particular philosophy of science. On that view, which is often called reductionism, science succeeds only when some given set of phenomena, say observations at some level, are fully explained by laws and initial conditions at a more foundational level. For reductionists, the real causes don't lie in the objects that we observe, but in the genes, or better, in physical chemistry, or even better, in microphysical waves and particles, or even better, I suppose, strings at the bottom. For emergentists, by contrast, non-reducible emergent systems are a feature of the biosphere which actually deepen the explanatory power of science. Science discovers differences in system dynamics at different levels of reality. The causal properties of a biological agent, for example, are crucial for explaining its behaviors. And evolutionary dynamics are often responsible for explaining new structures and forms and functions in the biosphere. Do you see that the goals differ? The goal of physics is, in general, to formulate these fundamental laws and to use them to predict phenomena. But now consider how different the situation is in biology. Imagine that lower level laws were used to predict gorilla behavior in general terms, but only uh, probabilistically. Say we have a very complex um, capital psi um, quantum mechanical equation, or we work with Schrodinger wave equation. Mm. Then the difference is, for example, in the social status of males would fall probably within the undetermined and presumably indeterminate region of these probability functions. But from an evolutionary perspective, this is the region that is of the greatest interest. Just ask a primatologist about which features of gorilla behavior are mo most salient in her research. She wants to know why one male has lower social status than another, why he is assigned this status, what he is likely to do when forced to play the subservient role, and what he would have to do 
to change his role within the social group. One thinks also of Jane Goodall's groundbreaking work with the large social group, the community, in Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania. Only when Jane assigned names to the individual chimpanzees, something that you wouldn't do in physics, <laughs> was she able to formulate the hypotheses that led to her famous conclusions in In the Shadow of Man. So in short, what is a virtue in quantum mechanics may be an explanatory failure in primatology. In even less law-like studies, say your artistic preferences, your individual artistic preferences, the equations tell us nothing about what we want to know. Now, this is the point where I would give the hour-long set of pictures about emergence across cosmic history. One always begins with the Big Bang and the way in which gradually structures emerged um, over time. Uh, actually, Lyon has a famous observatory, no? I think um, we had a friend who was here. Bruno was here at this um, famous, they, he did uh, early uh, dynamics of the universe in extreme redshift, right, if I remember, uh, Guido Doni. Um, so we would look at the origins of the cosmos, and then we would trace complexity across biological evolution, thinking about the incredible amount of complexity just in the movement of proteins, as pictured here. Uh, I think it's a BBC production. Um, from the very beginning, an explosion of complexity, even within a single cell, to now multicellular systems, emergence of a central nervous system, um, interaction among primitive organisms and with their environment, um, formation of a, of a recording uh, and um, functional control unit, a central part of the central nervous system, um, development of sociality, culture within animal species, and awareness of the perspective of other animals. Right? So now that would take us 20 minutes. Right? And then we'd want to move on and, and study primatology, the way in which complex interactions take place. Um, this is a picture of um, a bonobo cooking marshmallows. So a very American picture. I don't think we do this in Germany. Right? But this proves that they're civilized to Americans because they, <laughs> they make marshmallows all right? and eat marshmallows. There you go. I just want to make sure you saw the marshmallow. It's all. <laughs> No, shoot, We're, I don't know if we have time for the marshmallow. Okay, well, I'll just say, and then after that, we look at the complexities of human culture, right? Uh, as it develops through uh, um, primitive forms to civilized forms. Come on, get to the marshmallow. Here we go. <laughs> we have the stick. This is what our children look like also, right? And there's the marshmallow, okay. This is your American moment in Lyon, okay? And then finally, we move to the development of spirituality, organized religions, and the human notion of transcendence over time. So that would have been a far more interesting lecture. All right. Now, the question for us here is, what, if anything, do these phenomena of emergent complexity tell us about the beyond, about metaphysics and theology, about continuities and discontinuities about the knowable and the limits of the known. Initially, I fear we must draw some skeptical conclusions from natural emergence about proofs of the transcendent. The long tradition of Christian natural theology faces challenges in this context that are different than in previous centuries. So I want to be the voice of the skeptic today Somehow being with theologians always makes me want to play this role, um, as Chris and others know. Um, so as a, the skeptic doesn't need to argue to you that it's impossible to infer anything about a transcendent ground from emergent complexity. Rather, her argument is that you will need some metaphysical framework in order to begin from inside science and to move beyond science. Remember, your inferences have to be something that point toward a Jainsites 
a realm or dimension, uh, dimension beyond the boundary. Are you ready to do this? So the skeptic admits that many of you and even some scientists do affirm the required set of metaphysical assumptions and that you are therefore drawn to theistic arguments. But her point is that the grounds for your metaphysical assumptions are no longer compelling. Science qua science doesn't need them. In fact, she points out, there's a kind of circularity in natural theology today. If you already affirm the metaphysics of transcendence, then you can use it as a framework for inferences, say, from evolutionary biology, back up to divine reality. Do you see? If you already accept this, then you can take this and move to here because you've already walked the path. But if you don't begin with this framework, then the arguments for the existence of God do not compel her assent. So I, I could talk about submitting your arguments to a relevant community of experts in a sort of trial here, um, but I was afraid the reference to a British court might not be appropriate given the new separation, so I'll leave that, <laughs> that part out. The bottom line is we cannot say that the, natural, the arguments of natural theology are rationally compelling, no matter how personally compelling they may be for you. Now, you can, of course, find smaller communities that will be drawn to inferences from science to theology, from imminent to transcendent. But this fact doesn't overcome the skeptic's objection. Perhaps natural theology has now become a form of faith-seeking understanding. In short, a theology of nature. Now, I've developed this as a philosophical audience to try to wake up, a philosophical argument, to try to wake up the philosophers in the audience. Uh, so at least you can say we heard some philosophy. But now I want to shift and tie this argument more closely to the science of, sciences of emergence. So I want you to imagine the following dialogue, right? Maybe you've participated in this dialogue. So the theist says, emergence points beyond science because emergent levels are not determined by the laws and systems that underlie them. And then the emergentist naturalist replies, okay, it's true that I'm not a reductionist, but if emergence will, wants to be a scientific view, then it has to portray a universe that is fully open to scientific study. And that means it must be a form of naturalism, albeit one that's not reductionistic. It's a good answer. So then the theist replies, look, the tendency across cosmic evolution is an increasing or emergent complexity of the sort we would expect if God is guiding the process, to which the emergent naturalist replies, well, actually, the tendency across cosmic evolution is increasing entropy. Whatever you may observe in the short term, say, if you watch over the next 40 billion years, it does not undercut the final victory of the second law of thermodynamics. Well, that's true. So then the theist is getting frustrated. No, the theist responds, fine. On this planet, however, we see an evolutionary process that produces more and more complex organisms culminating with persons who are conscious, rational, morally, moral, and spiritually oriented beings, like ESAT members, um, which is consistent with the hypothesis of theistically guided evolution. To which she responds, consistent with is not sufficient. You are trying to argue that biological emergence actually points to a transcendent dimension. But everything that Clayton has presented today is fully consistent with a greatly expanded naturalism. You know, it's fascinating that one could trace the evolution of biological and social and cultural systems, that one could explain scientifically how one arises out of the other. But studying emergent systems doesn't 
or doesn't static studying emergent systems actually produce a naturalistic view of the world par excellence? To which the theist responds, no, because the whole process points beyond itself to its transcendent ground. It's teleological, it's goal-directed. I can see, she sa he says, behind the process of emergence as a whole, the hand of God. And she says, finally, and with this the conversation must end, and I see nothing of the sort. You, theists, speak of behind and beyond, but nothing in emergence compels me in these directions. So I urge you to appreciate the process itself, what it has produced and is producing. Now, of course, you may have your private experiences of awe and wonder, as I also do. But the fact that your experiences take theistic form does not mean that mine must as well. And actually, that's where I find the conversation usually goes with scientists. So where are we in Lille? So where are we in the argument? Where are we in the clock? <sighs> yeah. You will encounter this debate between theists and emergentist naturalists in many forms around the world. In fact, probably many of you have participated in this debate on one side or on the other. It's a debate I find fascinating. You see, for the theist to make his case, he needs a metaphysical framework. And it must be a metaphysical framework. It must be one that, A, if accepted, will support the inference from natural emergence to a trans transcendent ground or telos. Yes? That's his first requirement. And second, B, it ought to be accepted by scientists and others who understand emergence in the natural world. Right? That would be the goal of this movement from science by uh, argument to the transcendent. And I agree that we can meet the first condition. But a close study of emergent systems across evolution doesn't provide grounds for the ought, so that B, the second goal, is not met. So here's my thesis. It's crucial for the discussion this week to acknowledge that even for the theologian, the movement from a purely natural world to a transcendent dimension has become more difficult, indeed maybe inherently problematic. It's harder to find a middle ground than you might think because contemporary science is in many ways a self-contained endeavor. It works because we focus our attention on the kinds of systems where we can make successful predictions. For example, we assume that the ideal system, especially in physics, is one where we can subsume a variety of what look like diverse phenomena, movement of heavenly bodies and an apple on your head, under a set of relatively simple laws. Now, you can, of course, indicate your preference for views of the natural world where God regularly intervenes to bring about outcomes that God wills. Um, but here's the problem. Imagine that you're in the lab, right? And you have uh, results from multiple runs of a test that diverge, right? They're, they're not what you would expect. They're widely scattered. And so between experiments, you ask this guy, your friend, what is it? And he said, well, God is acting in the world, and these are results of God acting. Now, you have, she happens to be a theist. She says, well, okay, I mean, I understand a God, but science would be impossible if you're right. Not only difficult, but if God even could change the outcome of a given experiment, if God could ever be the explanation that the pH was higher in test number 21 than number 25, then science is impossible. So what's a theologian to do? I suggest that this argument points toward the conclusion 
but that we have no choice but to shift away from natural theology and instead approach this question from a different angle. Emergent evolution shows, I think, that one cannot ground an inference to a transcendent entity using the traditional arguments, for example, the regularity of physical laws, the explosion of complexity in biological evolution, the emergence of the sense of moral obligation over human history, or the growth of ideas of God in multiple cultures of the world. Now, people can and do build arguments from these phenomena, but given emergence, it no longer seems that the arguments validly show the emergent naturalist that she ought to embrace theism as a rational implication of today's best science. Bob Russell has coined the term creative mutual interaction to describe this. So think of theology or theology of nature as an exercise carried out within the confines of a particular faith community or theological tradition. But I think that this idea of a sophisticated theology of nature can learn from the sciences and also has interesting things to say about them. So watch, what I just did was move from the attempt to argue from science to the question of can you locate yourself in a position affirming transcendence in a way that is fully consistent with science. Do you understand? This is the crucial shift. And some scientists in the room will say no, but I want to argue that there's nothing in science to prevent this shift. And that's the remainder of the talk. Even given this shift, however, or perhaps precisely because of this shift in the arguments, I want to argue there are better and worse ways, better and worse ways to conceive the transcendent. Some are more compatible with emerging complexity, some less. Let's see if we can determine which is which. So, I start with a premise that I hope you'll find intuitive. The less one's notion of the transcendent is intertwined with the natural world, the more difficult it is to show its compatibility with science. Or, conversely, the more your theory of transcendence is metaphysically, what did I say here, or inherently includes immanence, the less difficult it is to show its compatibility with science. That seems paradoxical, but I think it's true. Actually, matters are a bit more complicated than this. I want you to picture a spectrum with the identity of trans, uh, a transcendence and immanence on the left and the utter separation of the two on the right. So here's the spectrum. If transcendence and immanence are completely identical, the extreme left, as they seem to be in Spinoza's Deus, Deus Siva Natura, or God, that is nature, then there's no difference to be, come, to be overcome and therefore no need of an argument. The complete connection of science and religion comes at the cost of not really asserting anything at all. On the far right of the spectrum, where the two are completely separate with no point of contact, there's also no conflict with science. But this god, the absent god, Deus Obsconditus, also has nothing to say to science, and science nothing to say to him. Victory has been won at the cost of irrelevance. Now, there's a third region that's problematic, I think. It's just in from the right-hand side. God is transcendent, but acts as a causal agent on the world, on the world. This is the miracle-working God in a particularly modern sense. Actually, C.S. Lewis uh, provides one of the um, formulations of it that I find most symptomatic. He says, nature, or at any rate, the surface of our own planet, 
is perforated or pockmarked all over by little orifices at each of which something of a different kind from herself, so uh, the divine is male, she's female, with a uh, kind from herself, namely reason, can do things to her at his pleasure. If God annihilates or creates or deflects a unit of matter, he has created a new situation. Immediately all nature domiciles, so she domiciles this new situation, makes it at home in her realm, and adapts all events to it. She, the world, is the perfect hostess to an unpredictable guest. Now, there's also a fourth position, and I think it's the strongest one. It's a theology in which the divine is understood to be metaphysically or ontologically imminent in the strongest possible sense. Now, on the spectrum, this position is to the left, but it can't move all the way to the endpoint, Deus Siva Natura. That is, imminence can't be so strong that transcendence is undercut. So now, how are we going to think these two together? And this is my last step in the argument. I want to think about this imminent transcendence from the standpoint of natural emergence. Now, consider how our emergentist naturalist, remember her from her red language before, um, like maybe the red letters in the Bible. Anyway, you remember that um, I want to know how she would respond to the research program that, I'm, that I've just outlined in these four options. So the first two positions don't really concern her because they don't affect her work as a scientist in any way. So regarding the first, she might say, well, you say that the world I study is divine. It just is God, Deus Siva Natura, pantheism maybe. She said, I have no need of the word God, but if you wish to use it as a synonym for what my colleagues and I in the various specialized sciences study, it doesn't really matter to us. Likewise, if your God is so transcendent, so utterly separate from this universe that he has nothing to do with it at all, I can't complain either. This God, by definition, can never get in the way of my science. It's irrelevant. By contrast, the miracle-working God, I, she says, I can never affirm. That God is incompatible with the core assumptions, the core methodological assumptions of my science. But now, friends, consider the fourth position, the intrinsically or radically imminent transcendent. So again, the goal is not to do natural theology. We're not asking someone to condone an inference from the world to God, and we're not forcing the emergent naturalist to make this move. Instead, we're asking whether this position on transcendence and Im imminence is coherent for those who affirm a transcendent being or dimension. Is it the most coherent way of thinking of transcendence and imminence with regard to discussion with science. And I want to think in, the, in my closing thought here about how our friend, the emergentist naturalist, might respond. So are you willing to give her some time? She hasn't actually spoken at this conference yet much, and so I want to bring her voice to you. So here's what she says. You affirm with me that there's a natural law-like order your God, many ESAP members, I think, your God, you say, does not intervene in this order to change physical outcomes. That means that scientifically accessible cause and effect relations are sufficient to account for biological emergence as a natural phenomenon. At the same time, she continues, you all believe that there really exists a transcendent reality which permeates the natural world 
She says, as far as I can tell, the natural world for you is something like the body of God in the sense that natural laws and the dynamics that they describe are like the autonomic functioning of the human body, perhaps. She says, I don't really understand most of what you say, but maybe it's something like that. So she says, so far there's nothing here that I as a scientist need to deny, even though I also do not affirm it. Now she continues, some of you, some of you maintain that this transcendent reality is not less than personal and that it exercises a kind of lure, a tug toward the good on persons, on organisms, on history as a whole. Maybe this is Francis Collins' view, that there's a sort of theological understanding, but without miracle working. I don't know, we have to think about. I invited Francis to talk with Richard Dawkins, but they weren't available here on this stage in Lyon. Mm. So anyway, you might argue this position, and she says, well, this makes me a bit more uncomfortable. But as long as you don't claim that this lure is scientifically discernible or that a god is breaking in to, to break the natural laws or to change the physical outcomes, I don't need to fight against your view. That's actually an interesting conclusion. She continues. In your metaphysics, a lot of you develop specific theories on the relationship between immanence and transcendence. And you tell me that your theories can be more or less coherent, more or less rationally acceptable. She says, well, I'm not really competent to judge because it's not a field that I know about. But these metaphysical dates, uh, debates could well be more than merely subjective preferences. You need to give her just a few more words. She says, I recognize that a theory of transcendence and imminence matters to those of you who take up metaphysical questions. It answers real questions that are raised by members of multiple religious traditions and many different metaph uh, metaphysical schools. They are not my questions, of course, but I can see that they do produce a different view of the world. Not just subjective, but actually a different view of the world that, you, that we live within. So, for example, you ask what the phenomena of the natural world communicate about the beyond. She says, I don't speak that language, so I don't ask this question, but my work is not undercut by those of you who do this. Finally, she says, I note that you call me a methodological naturalist. That's not a word I need. It's enough for me to say that I study emergence in natural systems. But in another term, in another sense, I find this word useful. Listen, this is uh, had an, it's an interesting conclusion. This term helps remind people that I, as a scientist, am not a metaphysical naturalist. In fact, because I'm not a metaphysician in any sense. If methodological expresses my view that I don't need a metaphysical defense for what I do as a scientist, then the term is helpful. And now we tell her she has to hurry up because we're out of time. Um, she says, you disagree you theologians disagree with metaphysical naturalists on whether a transcendent dimension really exists. The metaphysical naturalist tells me, as a scientist, that I need for him to be right in order to do my science. But here, I agree with you all and not with him. Naturalism is what science does and has to do, but I don't need any metaphysical defense to do science. Neither your transcendent God nor the metaphysical naturalist's so-called death of God. I think that's interesting. In sum, if you theologians only affirm that there's a depth dimension, a transcendent dimension or God of which all causes of natural events are parts, then we are not in conflict. I've allowed the, metaphys the um, emergentist naturalist to speak uh, in such detail to 
he sat at this august meeting in order to challenge a common fallacy. It's just not true that emergentist naturalism will inevitably conflict with transcendence language, at least if they're developed as I've done so here. And what about the belief in an intrinsically self-transcending nature and a transcendent divine reality that is radically imminent. Self-transcending nature and a transcendent divine reality that's radically imminent. And I want to argue in closing that understood properly, neither of these is antithetical to science, nor are its metaphysical distinctions meaningless because they transcend science but nor are they required by science. That's the cost you have to pay. So let me conclude. Nothing in science needs to exclude the language of transcendence. If one is able to establish their mutual compatibility, as I think I have, Imminence and transcendence cannot stand on opposite ends of the spectrum. Only if they are ontologically related can one speak of all reality as God-infused. And only then can one possibly think together an intrinsically self-transcending nature and an intrinsically imminent divine. Only in that case can one speak of an intrinsically self-transcending nature and an intrinsically imminent divine. And I want to add in closing, if I can take off my theological and my philosophical hat, I guess my scientific hat as well, so I'm hatless, um, I want to say that there are three places where imminence and transcendence may be fused more fully than in the conclusions we reach today. One of these is in religion internal language, a kind of language, maybe devotional language, that grows out of one's scripture or community of practice, a kind of way of thinking that's distinctively Christian, distinctively Jewish, distinctively Buddhist, distinctively Jain, Another approach is poetry and art, for reasons I think are obvious, no? And finally, there is the mystical experience. Gillian of Norwich was, not, was speaking as a mystic and not a metaphysician when she wrote, and all shall be one, and all shall be one, and all manner of thing shall be one. In the unitive mystical experience, the dualism of self and other disappears. It's just that when one returns to language, the distinctions reappear. We're back in the discussion we just had. As long as we are tied to language and thought, the imminent and the transcendent are not simply the same or simply different. They exist in dialectical connection. So only as long as this both and of imminence and transcendence is preserved can the open boundaries between science and the beyond science be maintained. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Phil, for this uh, enlightening, clearly structured talk uh, directly tackling our conference theme, imminence and transcendence, in such a clear and illuminating way. As we have it on our conferences, we will have a response to these lectures. And we saw um, Phil 
move from a, a person with three heads to a headless person, we will come now to a person that has at least two heads, two doctoral degrees, a, a science head and a, a philosophy head, and also theolo theology. Uh, the response to Phil's lecture will be given by Father Thierry Magnin, the rector of the university. He is an engineer and has a PhD in physics, as well as in theology. For more than 20 years, he taught physics at the saint Etienne School of Mines, as well as the Lille University of Science and Theology, two of the great French engineering schools. He was ordained as Catholic priest in 1985 and received a PhD in theology from the Catholic University of Lille in 1997. He served then as a vicar general at the Diocese of saint Etienne, and after having been the vice rector of the Institut Catholique in Toulouse, uh, he is now the rector of this Catholic university here in Lyon. He has written extensively on the dialogue between science and faith and published six books in French in this field, of which I only name the latest work from 2017, Thoughts on Humanity in a Time of Augmented Human Beings Dealing with the Challenges of Transhumanism. And we are very happy that you, as the host here at the university, will be giving the response. The floor is here, Thierry. So, is emergence leading nature beyond itself? It's one of the very difficult questions addressed by Philip Clayton in a very open way, taking into account a lot of controversies. Thanks, Philip, for your boldness, I would say, and the very exciting way you dare to ask questions and to propose possible answers with their limits. We, you try to put in evidence what you call signals of transcendence through a critical analysis of the definition of Peter Berger. You recall what is important, that if there is in fact a beyond, then the universe must be open to it. Thank you, for instance, for the disputatio you gave to illustrate this point between theist and emergentist naturalist in a very pedagogical way. You had also something which is not so obvious for many theologians or philosophers. This beyond must be consistent with the possibility of and the doing of science. I think it will induce a lot of questions. Does the scientific picture of the natural world give sign of the existence of a transcendent dimension? And if so, what kind of knowledge claims are being made? Or are they only visible to those who are, we have already faced or require some sort of divine inspiration? Thank you for your very pedagogical presentation of the questions of the beyond today. Your main purpose focus on the concept of emergence together with increasing complexity. And I will discuss that in the first point. What kind of phenomena emerge, you ask? What does it mean for a system to be emergent? The concept of emergence is both interesting and difficult, even from an epistemological point of view. The, the emergence system, as you said, is not deducible from what it emerges from its parts and from its law. Is it relied to a lack of knowledge, or is it question related to our power of knowledge and the action of another cause? Do we need to search elsewhere the efficient and final cause? Listen to you, I remember a sentence of uh, my master <laughs> in uh, philosophy of science, Jean Ladrière, who is a very interesting man from Belgium. 
he said about emergence of the cosmos itself. A sentence, please, if you have some words to comment, it will be nice. Jean Ladrier said, it's my English translation, so, if cosmos is a future which always emerge, it has in its structure itself an indeterminacy which needs a resolution at the level of an instauratory force able to act on the world which has to be for that at the limit of the world. It was in his famous book, L'Articulation du Sens. What do you think about this reflection which is in connection with your talk? Moreover, everything is interaction, relation. The real and the reality that can be reached by science is an interaction reality. And the origin of things gets away from the scientist the French philosopher of science and physicist Bernard d'Espagna spoke about the real as a veil reality, in fact. The latter, however, adds that he needs this unreachable real as the origin of things to sustain the empiric reality that is only revealed by scientific analysis. But the empiric reality usually presents itself to analysis from the angle of multiplicity. So this evolution combines the one and the many, the association and selection in the rise of complexity, strengths of union and strengths of dispersal, order and disorder, cooperation and selection at different level. I would like also, if you uh, can comment this question of uh, level of realities that you just uh, mentioned, that is Heisenberg and Bazarab Nicholas more recently uh, details the level of reality for this uh, uh, relation between immanence and transcendence. Is it a very interesting way to think about? I would like also, if you want to comment uh, this uh, question, the question is what emerged, but for me, the more important question is from where this structure emerged? From where? And that is a question uh, asked by the physicist, by the scientist. In a theolo theological point of view, some uh, theologian as Alexander Ganoxin said about Spinoza that there is a difference between the natura naturata and the natura naturans, which allows to think a kind of transcendence, which is not uh, without uh, connection with uh, what you said, I think. <coughs> Another point of discussion would be when you say beyond nature, we think about an exteriority beyond, behind, Okay, can this beyond can be also an inside? As, for instance, Nicolas de Cuse and very recently Teilhard de Chardin describe uh, in, a de in detail. According to Nicolas de Cuse, the creative fertility of God is due to the communion of the three, of the Trinity. Their union, which is absolute unity, is creating, creating, creative, and personalizing with man. Nicolas de Cus thinks like Bonaventure on this topic, that is to say that God is present until the depths of the matter. I think there is something connected with your depth dimension you, at the end of your talk. Right? And that is, that he is creating by shaping resemblances, all of this being transcendent. So I would like to know if this kind of approach, uh, old one at the 15th century <laughs> from Nicolas de Cuse in an apophatic uh, way of theology is interesting 
in the debate about your questions. And he make a very nice uh, uh, transition between classical monism to unitrinity, what he call unitrinity, which is the true one at the origin of the things. Is there a trace of the origin of things in the empiric reality? That is uh, the question. Just I would like to know about your comment of what Teilhard de Chardin said in this way. The great principle of union for, was for Teilhard de Chardin a kind of signal, as you said. Yeah. Because it seems to influence the rise of complicity in the history of universe with conjunction between entropy and negantropy. And for Teilhard de Chardin, but I would like uh, to know your opinion about, it is a, a sign of the one, of the unitrinity of Nicolas de Cuse, noticeable that in the empiric reality, uh, it can be observed. Do you think that this union in the difference, because it's an union in the difference, is not a fusion, the, this union in the difference that scientific analysis seems to indicate and that Teilhard de Chardin interpret as a signal of a superior union and the convergence in omega may be perceived as a trace of this origin of things. It is perhaps also a link that we, we try to observe between the consistence of uh, creation with the consistence of what science can not describe but approach. I would like to have your comment and thanks for uh, your job. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thierry. I think it's only fair to, because you asked so many questions, to fill that I give you the first word and then we enter into a discussion with the audience. I think we have a mic there. It's a wonderful invitation, and the most subtle critic is the one not who tries to falsify the sentences, but opens up the space that a talk points to, but doesn't go into. You can always see the lecturer either says, oh, bad questions, or in other ways doesn't know how to proceed. But I'd like to accept the invitation from a master to move into these, these areas, uh, especially those from the French literature. But I have to say, Thierry, that it, to accept your invitation, I have to accept a way of speaking that my talk pointed to but did not engage in. Remember, when I came to contradiction, then I spoke of silence. Maybe because I'm a Quaker, we do silence a lot, right? Um, but you ask me to speak in the space where this or that no longer holds, right? And I think some theologians in the room would say that is not the space of theology. But I think it is. So we actually share that in common. Bernard d'Espagne was for me um, a teacher back to the speaking at Le Senat with Jean in 1994 when I first met him. You can hear okay. Um, and as you correctly say, he saw in science, especially in physics, quantum field theory, a veiled reality. Now, if I accept your invitation, we, leave, we accept most of what was said in the talk, we move into a new space. I accept the radically imminent transcendent, and now I speak as a, as a theistic metaphysician and mystic, which I think is your invitation. And I say with Bernard de Spagna, uh, this is right. I see signs of that grounding function of the transcendent, veiled in the natural reality, underlying it, making sense of it, serving as a source for it. So it's actually, you've, I hope they'll see, you've led us on a four-step ascent up, up the mystical mountain. So the bottom will be, quantum physics, understood now from this, this 
imminent transcendent perspective uh, understood as the place where the ground of reality is veiled, but through the veil we see a little bit of it or hint of it when we accept it. Then you ask me to think about Basrab Nicolescu, whose understanding of the dynamics of evolution as one pole and the other pole and something new emerging is foundational in the French-speaking discussion of emergence. And he also has developed it in a more metaphysical way. His influence is Jakob Böhme, right? Um, Schelling, for, is Schelling important also for Basarab? I don't remember, but definitely the mystic Jakob Böhme has influenced his understanding. So there's a holism, a, a, a completeness, a focus on the one, even as he traces the metaphysical ascent. A great example. Um, you asked me to speak of Jean Atrieur, your, um, your teacher. I just say yes. I mean, I, I wrote down the quote, but I think we, there's not a difference. Let me follow your ascent so they can see where you were brilliantly leading us. To Nicholas of Cusa, right? The 15th century uh, Bishop of Cologne, uh, and uh, mystic, uh, who taught the coincidentia oppositorum, the coincidence of opposites. Here, the language of my paper breaks down, and we have to move to a kind of speaking beyond ordinary speaking, a speaking out of the mystical sense of oneness. The sense that what exists is a circle where there is no center where every point is the center. So an infinite cent uh, um, space that infolds, unfolds, and refolds. I mean, this is the view of Nicholas of Cusa, which allows us to speak of the all one as Trinitarian, the many as one. Now, do you guys see? Ground veiled, transcendent ground, emergence as a, as a sort of mystical process of unfolding, and now the absolute, the, the God of all things is also present in all things. Perhaps the most profound understanding of panentheism in all of Western thought. So in closing, the fourth step, Teyad de Chardin, is the principle of the human a sign of this one? Understood scientifically, strictly speaking, no. But if you follow Thierry in these three steps, and if you find this plausible, then you return to the one who has asked this question and made this journey, then yes. Thank you. Thank you.